Good afternoon. Today we are going to start a new unit uh, that involves quadratic functions. We are going to start today by looking at the different forms of quadratic equations, comparing and contrasting them to the other types of functions that we have reviewed. And also we are going to review what you learned about quadratic functions in Algebra 1. It's probably been a bit. We're going to start off with just some vocabulary. And actually, I'm going to be a wild and crazy girl and show you one that's already filled out. So it turns out that the standard form of a quadratic function is y equals ax squared plus bx plus c, where a, b, and c are constants. And it has to have an x squared term, but bx doesn't have to be there. The graph forms a shape that's called a parabola. The parent function, the really boring one, would be f of x equals x squared. Parabolas are symmetric about a central line that is called the axis of symmetry. I'm sure you remember that. It's a vertical line and will always be in the form of x equals some number. And then parabolas always have what's called a vertex. The axis of symmetry will all be the x coordinate of your vertex. And the y uh, coordinate of your vertex is also kind of helpful because it gives you either the upper or the lower bound for your range. It'll either be the bottom of your parabola or the top of your parabola. So that's just some vocabulary in quick review. Here is, well, I think it is. Here is a picture of a quadratic function. This is not the parent function, it's just some random function. The parent function again is x squared. This is of the form ax squared plus bx plus c. It um, is a parabola, we know that, but this I would love for you to put a star next to. This is the axis of symmetry. This is how we find the axis of symmetry using a standard form equation. And this is very helpful to remember. The y-intercept in standard form will always be whatever the c constant is. That c constant represents the vertical translation up or down of the parent function. In, if I'm looking at a graph, remember that the x-intercept is where the graph crosses the x-axis. Parabolas may or may not have x-intercepts, zeros, roots, solutions. Remember, those are all words that mean the same thing. And it's where the parabola crosses the x-axis. The vertex, gosh, I didn't even highlight the vertex here. Let me do that now. The vertex is where the parabola changes direction and starts going um, up if it was previously going down or vice versa. And then lastly, you can see the axis of symmetry goes through the vertex. And if you were to fold the parabola along the axis of symmetry, the two sides of the parabola would perfectly line up. Some other interesting things. If the A value is a positive number greater than zero, then the graph will open up like a cup. And the vertex represents a minimum which means that the um, y value of your vertex coordinate would represent the lower bound of your range statement. If the a value is a negative number, less than zero, then the parabola will open down like a frown. I just love saying that. And the vertex represents the maximum or the highest point on the graph. And the, the y coordinate of your vertex would then represent the highest or the upper bound of your range statement. What else have we got here? Oh, I like pictures. Here's another picture for you. Uh, this is actually a, um, well, actually it gives us the formula, x squared plus 2x minus 5. In this graph, I can see the x-intercepts or the zeros as we call them. Right, so that's where I cross the x-axis. I'm going to underline that. I can also see the vertex. The vertex is at negative 1, negative 6. Negative 1 represents the axis of symmetry. Remember, I said the axis of symmetry is always a vertical line. Its equation will always be x equals the x-coordinate of the vertex. And then the negative 6 in my vertex represents the lowest point on my graph. And that negative six is what we're going to use when we write our range statement. The x value, the input values in a function um, are called the zeros. 
They are also called roots, solutions, and x-intercepts. So those are just some more vocabulary words. And your graph can either have, I'm gonna move it up so you can actually see, your graph will either have two zeros, one zero, or no zeros. So it either crosses the x-axis twice, it touches the x-axis only once, or perhaps it doesn't touch the x-axis at all. So that is a quick review of things that hopefully you've learned in Algebra 1. You'll notice that because the parabola changes directions, it's definitely not linear. We can tell that by looking at the equation and noting that it has an x squared term. It's similar in some ways to the absolute value function because it does have a vertex, it is symmetric, but it has a rounded shape instead of the uh, straight sides that an absolute value function has. And those are some important differences. All right, let's look at some different forms of quadratic equations and quadratic functions. There is a standard form of a quadratic function, which we just spoke of. We can write quadratic functions in vertex form. Vertex form is very handy because I can immediately find the vertex in this form. It also gives me information about a horizontal transformation and a vertical transformation, and the A value would represent any uh, stretches or compressions that would happen. We also have factored form, which is also sometimes, I'm gonna put this under here, called intercept form. This one's nice because from here, I can immediately glean what the two or one x-intercepts are, and they are x-intercepts. This is factored form because these represent the two factors of the quadratic equation. And those are the most often used forms for quadratic functions. We're gonna take a look at each individual form. We're going to pull out the information that that form gives us, and then we are going to graph the forms. So let's start with standard form, since we already looked at it a little bit. One of the nice things about standard form is that I can immediately see what my y-intercept is. So I like that, that's pretty handy. I'm gonna even go ahead and cheat and write down here that my y-intercept is my c value, and so it will always be of the form. Actually, I'm gonna go ahead and do this, O, C. So my y-intercept is always gonna be of the form of zero comma C. And in this particular case, it's gonna be zero comma nine. So that's my y-intercept. And that I get that for free when I see an equation in standard form. Now, if there is no number, if it's just negative x squared, and there's no number here, that's because math people are too lazy to write the plus zero and your y-intercept would be at zero, zero. The next thing I'm gonna look at is my axis of symmetry. My axis of symmetry, like I said, is always gonna be of the form x equals, and then we have that formula that I asked you to star on the previous page, which was negative b over two a. The b and the a come from standard form. In this case, my a is going to be negative five, and there is no b value. Now, people are too lazy to write plus zero x. So when I do my substitution here, I have negative uh, zero over two times negative five, and zero divided by anything is just gonna be zero. So my x value for my axis of symmetry is going to be zero. I would write this more simplistically as x equals zero. And as we talked in the previous, on the previous page, this is going to be the x-coordinate of my vertex. To figure out what my y-coordinate is, I need to substitute this x value. Uh, I can't write and talk at the same time. Hold on. Substitute x into function. So I'm gonna substitute the x value into my original equation and out will come the y value that corresponds to it. So I had y equals negative five. And instead of using an x there, I am going to use what I, in this particular case, want the x value to be, which is zero. 
Gotta love that though, because negative five times zero squared is zero. I end up with zero plus nine. So my y value, ah, good grief. What was that? My y value is just going to be nine. So now I know what my vertex is. My vertex has an x coordinate that matches the axis of symmetry, and it has a y value of nine. And this is nice because that's going to be used in my range statement. And I'm just going to draw a little arrow here so you can see where that x value came from. The next thing I can determine is whether this graph is going to open up or open down. If it opens up, then my vertex represents a minimum. If it opens down, my vertex rep represents a maximum. In this case, my a value is equal to negative five, and that is less than zero. So I'm going to open down, and this represents a maximum. So the vertex will be the maximum of the graph. We've already identified the y-intercept, which is pretty groovy. The domain value for a function, because it's not bound, there's no endpoints on it, is just going to be negative infinity to infinity. You could also write that as all real numbers. You could use an inequality, negative infinity, less than x, less than infinity, whatever is most comfortable for you. We also spoke about the range value. Because my graph opens downward, I know that the vertex represents a maximum or the highest point. So the nine will represent the biggest number that my graph will use, the biggest y value, and it goes down, it's downward opening, so it's gonna go down forever. I will tell you folks, this is a very common mistake to make. Most of my students will recognize that nine is the bound of the parabola, but they'll switch the order of those two. So remember, um, it goes down forever. So it approaches negative infinity. And then the last thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to graph this lovely little creature. First thing I'm gonna do is identify the y-axis as my axis of symmetry. A couple of cute little arrows here. My axis of symmetry is at x equals zero. I know from the standard form that my y-intercept or my is gonna be at nine. So I'm gonna put a point right there. I'm gonna draw an arrow. I like to label everything. That's my y-intercept. I know it opens downward. And that's really about all I know about this graph. It's gonna go down. It's going to go down. That's really crooked. Forgive me. I'm not a genius at drawing parabolas. And then the last thing I would do is I could, if I wanted to, identify these two places as being the x-intercepts. I could also call this a root, or I could call it a solution, or I could call it a zero. Right, so many vocabulary words. And now we have sketched, this is not a technical graph, but we have a sketch of what our quadratic function would look like from the standard form. Sliding back up, let's look at vertex form. If I look at a function that is written in vertex form, this is, like I said, handy because I can identify what the transformations are and what the vertex is. So I'm gonna just put a note here. Obviously I can get the vertex because it's called vertex form, um, but it's also important to know that this is where I can see the transformations. And we will talk in later lessons about how to take an equation in standard form or an intercept form and then rewrite it in vertex form so that we can identify what those transformations are. All right, let's look. What kind of graph do I have here? The first thing I notice is there is no number in front of my parentheses, so my a value is actually gonna be one. 
we're just a little bit too lazy to write that. This is a is greater than zero, so it's going to be a minimum, and it's going to open up. So just from that alone, I have an, an idea of what the graph is going to look like. The next thing I'm going to note is that my transformations of the parent function give me my vertex. This little critter, that is my horizontal transformation because it's happening inside the grouping symbols and it's happening directly to my x. And if you remember, insiders lie. So this is x minus a positive 2. My vertex then has an x coordinate of positive 2. The y coordinate of my vertex is going to come from my vertical translation. This was translated vertically up 4. So I know that is the y coordinate of my vertex. If you remember from standard form, we have some cool things here. I know that this is my axis of symmetry. That's cool. I also know that this kid is going to be a range value. So we will use him when we're writing our range. To convert this form into standard form, we just do some simple multiplication I start off with my original equation. I'm going to expand it. I'm going to write two of these because that's what squared means, is that I have two of them. Please be careful and do not try to necessarily do this in your head. A lot of times what my students do, will do is they'll say, oh, this is x squared, negative 2 squared is 4, so it should be x squared plus 4. But if you actually use your distributive property, you get x squared minus 2x minus 2x plus 4. And then don't forget this kid. Lots of times he gets left out. And when I combine like terms, I end up with y equals x squared minus 4x plus 8. So now I have him in standard form. And from that form, we can find the information that we found when we were looking at our problem on the left. Okay, so because this is my C value, I know that my y-intercept is going to be 0, 8. And if I wanted to, I, well, I don't even need to. Um, I know that it opens up. I know where my y-intercept is. I know that there are no limitations set to it, so my domain is negative infinity to infinity. I know because it opens up and the um, range value is a minimum that the lowest point on my graph is going to be that range value, which we identified up here as 4. So that's the lowest point on my graph. And my graph is going to continue going upward forever. So now I have some pieces that will allow me to sketch the graph of this function. Remember, it's just a sketch. It's not a, an absolute. Um, exact replica, I'm going to draw my axis of symmetry at x equals 2 because that is the exponent of my vertex. I know my vertex occur, occurs at 2, 4, so I'm going to put him right there. I know that my y-intercept is going to be up here somewhere at 0, 8. And that's most of what I know about my graph. And I'm just going to sketch them ah, just as poorly as I did the previous one. Again, my vertex is at 2, 4. But it gives us an idea of what that graph might look like. Last one, folks. Thanks for hanging with me. For this one, get the clutter out of the way. We are given an equation that is in factored form. Again, this is also called intercept form because I can find what the intercepts are by, by looking at my graph. I notice that my a value is 1. And just like the previous problem, it's positive, so it's going to open up. This one is unique because it gives me my factors. That's why it was called factored form. I'm going to. 
There we go. Um, these are factors. These are algebra one factors. When you're in elementary school, your factors are things like factors of four, one, two, and four, factors of two, one, and two. But when we go into an algebraic world, our factors are often represented by algebraic expressions. To find what the x-intercepts are when given factors, I set my equation equal to zero because I'm trying to find the value of x when y equals zero. I'm gonna ignore the one if you'll allow me that latitude. And to find the actual x-intercepts or the zeros, I set each one of my factors equal to zero and I solve for x. So x is either going to be negative 4 or x is going to be equal to a positive 2. Those are my x-intercepts. If I write them as zeros root solutions, however you want to think of it, this is the value of x when y equals 0. So that is what we are able to discern. And if you're clever, you can do it uh, from just by looking at it, as long as the X inside the grouping symbol does not have a constant in front of it, then I can say, oh, insiders lie, so my X intercept's negative four. Insiders lie, so my X intercept is positive two. But again, be careful if there's a, a coefficient in front of your X. To write this in standard form, I'm gonna do much like I did with vertex form. I am going to expand, start with my original equation. I'm going to expand and multiply this using distributive property. And then I'm going to combine like terms and I end up with a function that looks like y squared, y equals x squared plus 2x minus 8 in standard form. Again, this is fantastic because it gives me some good information. I know where my parabola is going to cross the x-axis. I know that it opens upward. I know that my y-intercept is going to be at 0, negative 8, because that is the vertical translation down. It's the only part I really can see immediately in standard form. To find my axis of symmetry, I'm going to use that cool formula we talked about in the first example, which was negative b over 2a. When I substitute in, my b value is a positive 2, and 2 times 1 would be next. That's negative 2 over 2, so my axis of symmetry occurs at negative 1. x equals negative 1. To find my vertex, I'm going to identify what is the y value that is associated with this particular x value. So I'm going to substitute in, I guess I could do it into the standard form or into this form. The notes online will show you me substituting it into standard form should be the same thing regardless. This simplifies to a positive three. This simplifies to a negative three. I'm gonna go ahead and protect these. So my y value comes out to being negative nine. That allows me to finish my vertex with the x value being negative one. And when my x value is negative one, my y value is negative nine. So, now that's cool. If you remember, this gives me my range, and this is my axis of symmetry. My domain will continue to be negative infinity to infinity. My range is going to use that negative 9. My range value is a, a minimum. Sorry, yes, it is a minimum. Gosh, almost lost it there. So that is going to be the lower bound of my graph. And then my graph's gonna go upward forever. To sketch this graph, I am going to try to manipulate the paper a little bit more. I'm gonna start with my, my axis of symmetry, just roughly sketching this out.
that's my axis of symmetry. My vertex occurs at negative one, negative nine, which I'm gonna put way down here. My y-intercept, we said, was at zero, negative eight. So I'm gonna put him over here. And I know what my x-intercepts are. So I know my graph crosses the x-axis at x equals two. And I also know that it crosses again over here at negative four, zero. So this is kind of cool because it gives me lots of good information about what my graph looks like. Literally doing a shear badly. And that gives me a good representation of what this function, y equals x plus four times x minus two might look like. So quick review, folks. We've talked about the three different forms of quadratic functions. We've talked about all the characteristics that we can find by converting from one form to the other, and we did a quick sketch of them all. We will talk more about how to factor quadratic functions in our next lesson. Until then, have a swell day.